this video is a little different. On this occasion, we want to answer some of the most important questions facing the world today, and at the same time, the questions that shock us the most. Why are so many countries issuing debt at negative interest rates? Why are investors willing to pay money to finance nations? How do politicians hope to finance the immense public spending plans they are approving in response to the coronavirus? And what if I were to tell you that these two questions are closely related to the increase in the wealth gap that has been recorded over the last few decades in developed countries? Are you ready to get into the the ins and the outs of the global economic system. Well, let's get started. The coronavirus crisis is a harsh and unavoidable reality for economies and governments around the world. Measures taken to tackle the health crisis, such as quarantine or business closures, have not only sunk economic activity, but also tax revenues. At the same time, governments are putting in place all sorts of stimulus plans to try and get around the crisis, i.e. they are taking public spending to previously unknown levels. Coronavirus. Trump signs into law largest bailout in US history. BBC. Germany announces 130 billion euro stimulus package as unemployment rises in Europe. Euro News. Japan to subsidize 100% of salaries at small companies. Program aims to pay 10 million laid off workers their full wages. Asia Nikkei Review. Just last month, on 21st of July 2020, the 27 partners of the European Union agreed to approve an emergency plan, an economic stimulus plan of 750 billion euros or just over 850 billion US dollars at current exchange rates. A plan that requires the European Commission to issue huge amounts of debt to the market in order to be financed. That is to say, the public debt of minor states will now also be added on a larger scale to that of the European Commission itself. The recovery fund agreed at the European Council total 750 billion euros. A general Marshall plan to provide a strong response to the COVID-19 crisis focused on the transformations needed to achieve a more resilient, green, digital and inclusive economy. Pedro Sanchez, President of the Government of Spain. Added to this European Community Plan are the stimulus plans approved by each member country on an individual basis. We are talking about a combined response of hundreds and hundreds of billions of euros. Meanwhile, outside of Europe, other countries throughout the world are doing exactly the same thing. Now, it stands to reason that if, as a result of the economic crisis unleashed by SARS coronavirus 2, public revenues fall and government spending increases, what do we find? Three, two, one. Exactly! Huge public deficits. And that's exactly what's happening. Let's take a look. For example, at the case of the great North American giant, the United States started 2020 with a public debt that was already above 105% of GDP. But that fact, that fact has become outdated faster than Maduro's Bolivars. After the coronavirus crisis unfolded, US Congress approved the largest bailout in history, a rescue of more than $2.3 trillion. The federal government has started burning dollars at full speed. To give you an idea, just looking at the period between mid-April and mid-June 2020, the US national debt increased by more than $2 trillion. Yes, $2 trillion, with a T, in just over two months. And take note, because the forecast is that the federal government will close 2020 with a huge public deficit, really, hold on to your chair, of nearly $4 trillion, which, in terms of GDP, accounts for more than 17% of their entire economy. Yes, yes, you did hear correctly. We're not talking about Argentina or anything like that. We're talking about the United States. I'll repeat the figure. A pub Public deficit of more than 17%. US federal budget deficit will approach $4 trillion in 2020, CBO says, as the economy continues to nosedive. Forbes. And it could be even worse if things don't get better soon, and Trump manages to pull off a second term in the upcoming elections. The president has already indicated that he is willing to burn all his bridges to be re-elected. <laughs> In this way, the United States will close 2020 with a public debt close to 130% of GDP, more than $28 trillion. To give you an idea, that amount is equivalent to twice the entire Chinese economy, seven times the German economy, or 20 times the Spanish economy. And that may explain news like this. US to hit Japan-like levels of government debt by 2050, Budget Group says, Market Watch. And the obvious question is, how on earth are governments going to fund this gigantic torrent of public debt? Billions 
and trillions of dollars. More and more public debt. Well, it's right here where one of the most important institutions in global economic fabric swings into action, central banks. Do you want an example of the role this type of institution plays today? Well, look at this. During March and April, the US Treasury Department issues $15.6 billion in Uncle Sam's debt bonds. And the question is, do you know how much debt from the US government, the Fed, or the Federal Reserve bought during the same time? Well, no more, no less than $15.5 billion. That is, during the months of March and April, the Federal Reserve purchased the equivalent of all debt issued by the US government. It didn't do it directly, that's true, these were debt purchases that had already been issued, but ultimately the result is the same. The Federal Reserve creates artificial demand on public debt, keeping the prices and interest rates of government issued debt bonds low, as well as ensuring market liquidity. Yes, that's right. The Federal Reserve is backing the debt issued by the United States government at very high levels never seen before. And the question that many of you are surely asking here is, how is the Fed paying for the purchase of this huge amount of US government debt? Well, friends, I'm sure if anyone is watching us from Argentina, they know the process all too well with new money, with money created out of nowhere. Yes. Yes, you heard me perfectly clear. The Fed, just like the other central banks, can create money out of nowhere. You could say they've gone a bit nuts with the money printer. Of course, it's actually much easier these days just typing a few numbers into the computer to create new money, new money, with which they then make transactions like this. Wait a minute. So are central banks creating new money to buy public debt as if by magic? Well, yes, that's exactly what's going on. Now, what exactly is the strategy? What consequences can these type of processes have? How far do their operations go? Well, these are the topics we'll look at in this video. But first, first, we need to know exactly who they are and how the central banks work. Let's go. The heart of the financial system. What exactly is a central bank? Yes, I know they are usually totally unknown entities to the general public, but nevertheless, when it comes to the moment of truth, their involvement in our lives can have huge repercussions. Central banks are the entities that manage the production and distribution of money. They control the monetary mass and level of interest rates. They are the nerve center, the heart of the modern financial system. Of course, we're talking about a very special type of bank and not just because they don't interact with the public. Their customers are basically commercial banks. Their main objective is usually to maintain price stability and in some cases also support job creation and economic activity. Friends, these institutions have become such important entities for the modern financial system that every time a crisis situation occurs, they are often the first line of defense that politicians around the world turn to. And the question is, for what reason? What do they do? You see, central banks traditionally resort to strategies such as changing interest rates, injecting new money into the economy, or supporting banks with liquidity problems. That's why they're also known as last resort lenders. In fact, I'm absolutely certain, and I mean I'm really sure, that everyone, absolutely everyone, no matter which corner of the globe you're watching us from, has heard of the central bank lowering interest rates to stimulate investment and thus push the economy forward. It stands to reason that when companies can finance themselves at lower interest rates, they tend to invest more, which in turn generates more economic activity and more jobs. Of course, as we will see, this has many other implications because the interest rate in practice is reduced by injecting new money, which in turn can erode the value of existing money. That is, it can create inflation and many other economic problems. Despite the downsides, the fact is that lowering interest rates was the basic strategy used right up until the last major crisis, the 2008 financial crisis. At that time, the central banks in virtually every developed country on the planet lowered interest rates to zero. For example, this chart shows what the Federal Reserve did at that time, which is something very similar to what the Central Bank of Japan once did. 
And the question is, what happens when the rates are already incredibly low, at levels close to zero? What can central banks do in that situation? Careful here, it's not just any old question. Everything that is happening today related to bailouts and economic policy hinges on this question. But okay, I'll explain. For example, when the coronavirus crisis broke out, central banks did the first thing they always do, lower interest rates. But of course, lowering them from 0.5 to 0% doesn't make much of a change. It's not like when they were reduced from 6% to 3%, for example. Therefore, the effectiveness of this action is much more limited. Of course, that doesn't mean that they're going to stand around scratching their noses, not at all. This problem was already brought into focus from 2008, and that's when the central banks introduced the so-called unconventional monetary policy, also known in pompous technocratic language as quantitative easing. And what are these kinds of political strategies? Well, basically, get the machine printing paper money over and over again, which in modern terms means taking a keyboard and starting to compulsively press the number keys to create more and more new money. And as we usually say around here, no sooner said than done. Look, for example, at how the Federal Reserve increased the amount of money in circulation from 2008 onwards. And the question that we all need to ask is, what on earth are they doing with all this new money? Well, basically launching it on the market to buy all kinds of assets, mortgages, bank bonds, and mainly outstanding government debts. That is, as we have already said, they buy it from other investors and not from the governments themselves, because officially, unless you are a country such as Venezuela, it is forbidden to monetize debt. In other words, central banks cannot directly finance government. Although in practice, what they do is very similar. In any case, the idea with this quantitative easing is to flood liquidity markets, create artificial demand, and thus reduce financing costs for governments, banks, and businesses. For example, in just over six years between 2008 and 2015, the Fed's balance sheet increased almost fivefold, from $1 trillion to more than $4.5 trillion. So, in just over six years, the Fed created more than $3 trillion new dollars to intervene in financial markets and adulterate financing costs, especially the cost of financing the US government. And it wasn't just something that the United States did. The European Central Bank, the Central Bank of Japan, and the Bank of England, among many others, they did the same. But that, that was nothing compared to the response they have now given to the coronavirus crisis. Friends, you may not know it, but in 2020, we are witnessing a historic financial experiment, the greatest quantitative expansion in history. And take note, because this experiment is not without risks. Do you want to know what we're up against? Well, listen up. Corona Recession, the heavy cavalry arrives. Friends, this time the central banks have decided to jump in head first. Yes, as we have seen, they already played a decisive role in the previous crisis. Now in 2020, they have decided to move to the next level. Look closely, for example, at how the Federal Reserve has reacted. Take note, just in the four months from March to June, the Fed has created money and expanded its balance by nearly $3 trillion. For you to get an idea, this is more than the size of the entire economy of India, the United Kingdom, or France. It is such a large amount of money that, hypothetically speaking, the Federal Reserve could have bought almost all the companies listed on the London and Milan stock exchanges, or if you like, all companies listed on the exchanges of Germany, Spain, and Brazil put together. And then the key question comes back again. What exactly are they doing with such vast quantities of money? Well, buying everything. Federal government debt, debt from states, municipalities, banks, mortgages, and even corporate debt from large private companies. And it's not just about the Federal Reserve. If you take into account the federal banks of the US, Europe, Canada, and the UK, Japan, and Australia, the forecast is that together, they expect to increase their balance sheets by a minimum of more than $9 trillion by the end of 2020. And if things don't get better by the time that stimulus runs out, we could be talking about a lot, a lot more money. And there we have it. That's exactly how politicians around the world hope to find their gigantic economic stimulus and rescue programs. They're basically relying on central banks to create enough new money to artificially stimulate demand for the debt they've created that will allow them to finance all their huge public spending plans. For example, by the end of 2020, the European Central Bank is expected to own more than 30% of all public debt issued by all Eurozone countries. More than 30%. In other words, the main creditor of Eurozone member countries will be the 
European Central Bank itself. So, in other words, central banks have become the tool that makes all public spending increases possible. But wait a minute, hold on, stop. We create new money and that's it? Is it that easy? Well, obviously not. Printing more and more money has consequences. Those of you who are watching us from countries like Argentina or Venezuela know this all too well. These kinds of policies erode the value of money and cause problems such as inflation, financial instability, and bubbles of all kinds. Even worse, your government is unlikely to tell you this, but they could also cause greater inequality. But here, some of you may be thinking, but Josh, inflation, come on. Why? If we're at minimum levels, well, yes and no. It depends on how you look at it. For example, over the past few decades, major technological innovations and globalization, with the entry of countries such as China into global markets, have led to a great increase in productivity and efficiency. With that, prices could have collapsed, and yet they haven't, have they? In other words, there has been inflation camouflaged by the effect of improvements in production. Not only that, what happens if we compare the evolution of house prices, the evolution of stock exchanges, and other assets with respect to wages? In all cases, they have greatly increased at a rate much higher than wage increases. And that, coupled with the increasing difficulty in accessing housing, for example, explains why inequality between the richest and the poorest is growing in developed countries. Yes, that's right. Monetary policy has a lot to do with the growing wealth gap in developed countries over the past two decades. And as you will see, along with this effect of inflation on assets, that obviously benefited those with the most net worth, there is also another phenomenon known as the Cantillon effect. You see, it can be confusing, but creating new money fundamentally favours the first ones to receive it. That is, the first to finance themselves with this new money created out of nowhere, the first to be watered with the money of the central bank. Why? Because they are the first to be able to trade with the new money before it has an impact on prices, whether in consumer goods or investment goods. And who are the first to access these resources? Well, governments, banks, and large companies. And this is also why governments are getting bigger and making life for small and medium-sized enterprises increasingly difficult. What's more, when the European Central Bank or the Federal Reserve buys debt bonds from companies such as Not Telefonica or Telecom Italia, they get them to be financed at ridiculously reduced rates, despite being heavily indebted. What they do is favour them over smaller companies that have to pay much more for their financing. And if we combine these three effects, the result is that these kinds of monetary policies not only carry the risk of creating new bubbles and fueling public spending, but they also increase inequality between the richest and the poorest. Surprise? Friends, the coronavirus crisis is screaming out for strong action. But aren't we trusting the capacity of central banks a little too much? Are the incentives of decision makers or politicians in our best interests, or are they looking more at the short term to the next election? Are we really prepared to face the consequences of all these policies? Aren't we in danger of japanizing our economies, becoming addicted to debt, hypertrophying our states, and damaging the value of our currencies? At Visual Politic, we will be paying close attention to how events take place. But as we always say, we ask the questions and you provide the answers. So leave your answer in the comments. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Please hit like if you did, and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos. Also, this channel is possible because of Patreon and our patrons on that platform. Please consider joining them and supporting our mission of providing independent political coverage and as always, I'll see you in the next video.